Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Abhas, and with me here is Team 14903, SharkBots from Memoronic, New York. They are currently uh, doing extremely, extremely well this season. They're number four by total non-penalty OPR, third in the world by Teleop, and just a fantastic team all around. I think this team is one of the fastest robots you will see in Teleop this season, at least until this point, and I can't wait to learn about it coming up on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Studica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels with several new colors coming soon to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allows for positioning at multiple angles. Feel the Studica Robotics difference, and if you're in the USA, request a structure sample for your team at studica.com slash robots. Kettering University's cutting-edge programs and their experiential co-op model seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds, offering hands-on, feature-focused learning that empowers students to pursue new ideas and inspires other institutions to follow their lead. Don't just be ahead of the curve, create the curve. Get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Okay, SharkBots, so, you know, New York is a pretty competitive region year after year. I think this season, your guys' teleop has just been on another level. What do you think were, like, the biggest factors you were considering coming into the season and, like, wanting to have such a strong teleop? So, like, the main factor is definitely driver practice. Uh, I think, like, we sort of aimed for our robot to not try to do something too complicated. Like, we just have, like, claw to claw transfer, um, ex like, horizontal extension slides, vertical slides. And that just let us have something that like we knew wouldn't take too long to iterate on and get working and focus a lot on just driver practice. Cool. And so on the topic of driver practice, if you could just like give some numbers or insight, like, you know, how often are you practicing? Do you think there's anything special you do in practice that teams could learn from? Yeah. Um, so for driver practice, what we've been doing is just like, um, I guess, maybe like two, three hours per week. Um, and then what we do is we record um, drive practice sessions. So we'll have like some videos of like, you know, solo runs. And then based off of that, seeing like how consistent we are in our runs, maybe like maybe pickups are taking more time, maybe deposits are taking more time. And then based off of that, seeing like where we can improve. Got it. Yeah. And as far as like scrimmages go, is that something you guys do a lot with like sister teams or other teams? Or is it really just more solo practices work well for you? Uh, we've done both. Mainly so far we've done solo practice. We have a sister team and we do some scrimmages with them And then we're thinking about doing more scrimmages with like teams in our area um, Awesome going up to space. So yeah, I think one thing I've noticed definitely with your intake is the claw, right? It is just so so fast So why don't you start by giving us an overview of your intake claw and then we can go into some of the specifics Okay So our intake claw is mounted on extension slides. Um, we can go up near the sample hover over the submersible you can rotate and then just pick up the sample like this. And then we have um, a transfer sequence. So both claws are the same. And so what we can do is we can just hand it off really easily um, after picking up and that's, that's worked out well for us. Awesome, yeah. And as far as iterations go, what, what do you think, like, you know, you mentioned a lot of degrees of freedom. You have that role, you have all the pitches and all of those things. Did you just do everything right from the beginning or was it like you had only a couple of them in the beginning and then you realized, okay, no, we could use the role. Let's add that. How did that look for you guys? So like f from the start, um, well, we are, we, are, we wanted, I guess the degrees of freedom were there from the start um, because you notice that, okay, first of all, you need, um, Obviously, you need your rotation in order to properly align your, um, your samples in the submersible. Um, but then also, when it comes to things like transfer, for example, not only do you want to pivot, but if you're picking up um, at a certain angle like this, you need to have that rotation in order to properly transfer. And mm -hmm. so we wanted that from the get-go. Um, and then, I guess, same thing for um, our deposit slides, for our deposit claw. We also wanted the ability to do specimens um, and so same thing you want again want that rotation to be able to do both got it yes that that makes a ton of sense and as far as iterations go do you think there was any like key changes you made to your claw that just really leveled up how it worked whether it be in hardware or software yeah so so if you look at the geometry um, like we just made this change recently actually so like if you look at this claw it's a little bit different uh, than our um, intake claw. So this mm -hmm. was the first version, and this is the second version. 
And the second version you can see is a lot more like aggressive. So it's a lot more pointy. This one's uh, much more rounded. And so like we've just uh, seen that it can pick up um, like if there's three samples that are all like together, it mm -hmm. can pick up the center one much more effectively. Okay. And so like uh, we like like so like by doing this change, like we've reduced uh, like missed pickups, basically. Got it. Um, yeah, that that makes a ton of sense. Now, going on to your deposit, you know, I think you guys have kind of this uh, like mentality of keeping it very simple as far as the stringing and the, those components of the slides are concerned. Uh, you know, what ratios are you running? How have those worked out for you? Did you see any need to change those throughout the season? Um, so we can start with the lift. Um, so the lift, um, we're actually running free motors on the lift. Um, so you can see here if we, um, yeah. So we just have like a gearbox here and they're all uh, just chained together. Mm -hmm. And so they're um, 1,150 RPM motors and we have a 19 millimeter spool. So it's a pretty small spool. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is that we hang with those same motors and we also obviously use it to uh, deposit in the bucket normally. Um, okay. And yeah. And yeah. so like that changed um, because like just to make sure that hang um, like I mean like just to make sure that like we could hang consistently because we were having some efficiency problems uh, so that was like one iteration that we made on the stringing and then for the extendo uh, it's just stayed the same we have uh, like a 435 rpm and like a 36 millimeters full okay um, got it and so w were those three motors something you decided to have like the entire season or it's like you started with two you decided you need just a little bit more power so you went to three for that hang so like, because of our design architecture, um, since we have a claw base intake and not um, an active intake, that frees up another motor. And so we didn't really need that motor for extension. So we said, okay, why not go for um, three motors on the lift? Mm -hmm. We thought about, you know, I, you know, designs like having a PTO, but we wanted something that was like more consistent and easier to implement for the beginning of the season, because you know, that's reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and so motors has, has worked out well for us. Awesome, yeah, and last thing about the lift, I think I see your inserts are a little different than I normally see with teams. Uh, do you yeah. have something special going on there? Is there something you want to talk about or are those pretty standard? Um, so it's so it's basically like a, um, a half aluminum, half 3D printed. So we have like, um, like a bent aluminum piece that you can see that's like uh, this. And then on the inside, we have a 3D printed part and that part is basically just in compression. So we didn't want to make it fully 3D printed, um, just just to be able to make sure that it's like super strong, um, and so that's why like we have like the aluminum on the outside. Um, Got and, it. And yeah, so it, that that aluminum is that something you bent yourself, or it's like aluminum angle that you're using and just cutting off appropriately? So we have uh, fabrics bended. Um, okay. Very cool. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, you know, talking about your hang, I see you guys have these very long sloping arms in the back. What is the functionality of those? Is there anything special going on there? We have countersprung hooks in order to hang um, like this. So mm -hmm. what we do is we can go under the bar and simply extend our size up. And what, what will happen is that it'll actually automatically align the bar for us. And once we engage um, on the bottom here, the robot will tip backwards basically and then hang like this. Awesome. Yeah. And I think I saw uh, at least the level two hang from you guys. So looking forward into the future, is level three something you're interested in or you think just level two is fast enough, you get more points elsewhere? We're looking into it um, possibly with like servo hang for the first stage and then using our slides for level three. Mm -hmm. But right now, like level two is pretty, pretty fast. So in terms of like getting more cycles out without losing too much time to hang, um, that's worked out really well for us. So got it. Yeah, and you know, touching on software a bit, what do you think are the key automations that really level up your guys' teleop? Um, so we use like we use FTC Lib for um, our automations. So we have like in, we have sequences um, in order to do like intaking and then depositing. So for example, I can press a single button here, um, and then that'll shoot out the intake. It's another button to intake and then transfer. And then let's say I want to deposit um, a sample. Um, that's only one button. Very so cool. I can deposit. So in terms of like driver automation, uh, there's not too much for the driver to think about. Um, and so it's just like you have a more streamlined approach in order to, um, for the game. Awesome. Yeah. And so I, I think the last thing I want to touch on is about the whole specimen versus sample 
uh, debate, right? So I think in your last competition, you guys hit your five plus zero specimen auto every single time, which is fantastic. And But in Teleop, you seem to much prefer samples. Is that correct? So what was the reasoning behind, uh, you know, like this difference? Um, so in terms of like actual difference, we have the ability to do both. So I guess I can show you here. So um, due to our design architecture, we have the ability to do both specimens and samples. So I can pick up a specimen and deposit like this. Um, but the reason why we do mostly samples is because you get a higher um, contribution. You get more points out of different samples because like we don't have, let's say like a clip bot. Mm -hmm. um, but we have the ability to do both. Okay. And actually, competition before that, we were um, mostly doing specimen. Um, and so for this competition, we decided to mostly do samples. Um, to see like yeah, which one. Yeah, just different things out, see how it goes. Yeah, obviously it worked quite well for you guys, right? Like third teleop OPR in the world is, is no easy feat, uh, but yeah. All right, uh, and you know, just looking forward to the New York Championship, and you know, hopefully qualify for Worlds and stuff like that. Are there any game strategy uh, advice that you have for teams who are looking to just take their telly off to the next level? Um, I would say probably focus on um, on I would say focus on being um, adaptive. So practicing in different environments, where let's say you have like some teams blocking you, or maybe you. You know, one time you, you try driving, um, let's say picking up from the chamber area, maybe another time you try from um, a submersible. I would say like having a lot of different scenarios planned out so that when you run into those in competition, you don't feel stressed or you don't have like a panic attack. Yeah, absolutely. All right, SharkBots, well, thank you guys so much. You guys have been absolutely killing it this season. I can't wait uh, to see how you guys do in early March. You know, best of luck. Reporting for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Abhas, and this is Team 14903 SharkBots. Thank you. Kettering University's cutting-edge programs and their experiential co-op model seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds, offering hands-on, future-focused learning that empowers students to pursue new ideas and inspires other institutions to follow their lead. Don't just be ahead of the curve, create the curve. Get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Studica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels with several new colors coming soon to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allows for positioning at multiple angles. Feel the Studica Robotics difference, and if you're in the USA, request a structure sample for your team at studica.com slash robots.